Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. On this podcast, we talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. And I'm pleased to welcome David Keith. He is an, a, a professor of applied physics at Harvard University. David, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Thank you very much. Good to be here. So we're going to talk about geoengineering today. I didn't warn you, uh, but guests on this podcast introduce themselves. So you have a long CV. I'm not going to go into that. Imagine you've arrived somewhere and you have about a minute to introduce yourself. Please do so. I worked on climate kind of forever since 1980s. Uh, I've wandered around a bunch of different topics from uh, real climate science to energy technology. I started a company called Carbon Engineering and I've worked on this topic of solar geoengineering uh, for on and off for the whole time. Gotcha. Well, so I, I want to, I, I don't have a, a particularly strong opinion on geoengineering. I, to me, what makes it appealing is that I, I don't see pathways for large scale uh, uh, mitigation. I just don't see right now, particularly in the wake of the Russia Ukraine war, any international agreements on reducing CO2 emissions or carbon hydrocarbon consumption. Um, but well, it, I mean, international if, agreements aren't often the way we accomplish things. Are you saying you don't think it's possible to cut emissions? I, I think it's possible to cut emissions. I just don't see right now that there's a lot of traction on that, just given the re return to coal, what's happening within Europe, uh, uh, China and India, et cetera. But that, that's a different discussion. What no, I think, I is, think we, it's a very linked discussion. So I see okay. it differently. Okay, sure. Um, from my perspective, as I said, I've been working on climate forever. I see much more action and reasons to believe there will be action than I have for a long time. You know, in the end, uh, political rhetoric is cheap. What really matters is the flow of capital. Because sure. in the end, we're replacing all the heavy industrial infrastructure of the planet, replacing high emissions infrastructure with low emissions infrastructure. And that flow of capital, you know, rose in the early 2000s up to around 2010, plateauing around 300 billion a year. And then it's risen again to somewhere of order of six, 700 billion a year. And that's real. And you can see that in the flows into battery electric vehicles, into wind and solar power. So that feels in a way that material that it wasn't before. And I think the level of political uh, focus is higher than it was before. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll grant all those things. Um, but let's jump into solar geoengineering because you've made the argument and I've read several of the papers you've, you've written and uh, uh, listened to your YouTube uh, lecture that was from 2019. Uh, you, you wrote this piece in the New York Times last year. You said, this is what it comes down to, carbon removal or solar engineering or both. At least one of them is required to cool the planet this century. There are no other options. Um, so tell just briefly, solar geoengineering. You're talking about injecting particulate into the atmosphere that would reduce the, the forcing from solar radiation onto the earth. And that that's the, you believe this is, you've made the point, this is going to be one of the key tools we have to use to make, to reduce the, the risk of catastrophic climate change. Is that a fair well, summary? Well, that's of what a you... different statement. I'm not saying what we have to do. Okay. That's, I, I'm not in charge of anything. So uh, I can say what I think solar geoengineering is. And to me, it's a range of different methods, but it's basically deliberate human action to alter the radiative balance of the Earth uh, by reflecting sunlight away, most obviously. And so that might be done in principle by a giant solar shield uh, in between the Earth and the sun. I don't think that's not likely to happen in this half century, but I think it's not implausible later on. Uh, putting aerosols in the stratosphere, sort of twice as high as a regular airplane flies, is the thing we understand the best, the thing that most easily can be even. I think probably the thing that has the best ratio of, of reduced risks to, to the new risks it brings. But there's a bunch of other ideas of thinning cirrus clouds or making marine boundary layer clouds whiter or making land surface whiter. So there's a bunch of ideas. All those ideas I lump together as solar geoengineering or sunlight reflection methods or, you know, people, it's a disputed topic. So that's broadly what it is. And what I said in that New York Times op-ed, which I think is a, a, just a correct statement, is that, that if you want at any time to make the temperatures cooler than they are at that time, you have to either take carbon out or do solar geo because warming is proportional to cumulative emissions. So even if you bring emissions to zero, you don't cool the planet down. And so right. you have to do one of those two things if you want to cool it down on a policy relevant time scale. Well, you also made a forceful, you had a forceful line in that New York Times piece. You said, pretending that climate change can be solved with emissions cuts alone is a dangerous fantasy. If you want to reduce risk from the emissions already in the atmosphere, you must look to carbon removal, solar geoengineering, and local adaptation. 
Um, I'm also not bullying, uh, bullish on carbon removal just because of the scale the scale issue, which uh, I've, I've written some about. But you focus on some of your work on, in particular, on sulfuric acid. Why sulfuric acid, and how much would it take? You you, you make the case that it was a relatively small number of airplanes, a hundred uh, or so, that could be based in the tropics. What is it about that uh, sulfuric acid that makes it uh, so attractive as the 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 type of material that you use to put in an aerosol into the atmosphere? Well, I think it's the thing we know the most about. In a sense, it's the devil we know. So there's lots of other compounds you could conceivably use in the stratosphere. The sulfuric acid is really just there to keep the water there, if you like. It's one way to think about it in the sense that a water drop in the stratosphere will work great, but the stratosphere is so dry it would evaporate instantly. So the sulfuric acid is in a sense there to keep it from evaporating. And uh, it, it's what nature does. So there is sulfur in the stratosphere that does cool the planet with volcanic eruptions. And we have this giant and terrible experience with sulfuric acid air pollution in the lower atmosphere. We put sort of 50 million tons a year of, of, of sulfur from fossil fuel combustion in the lower atmosphere, which kills sort of a order of 5 million people a year. So that also means that we know a lot about it. And so it, it, it means that we can have some confidence about uh, unknown unknowns, I think. So you said that it was in your 2019 presentation. Uh, it's called The Peril and Promise of Solar Geoengineering, which is on YouTube. Uh, you said it would require a new design of airplanes, uh, an airplane, you need about 100 of them, and they'd fly 120,000 flights per year. Uh, what would these planes look like? Do any of them exist? What, is there a prototype? Or where is there any? Uh, I know you, you make a particular point about the ratio of, of funding for geoengineering relative to the broader issues around climate science. But where are we on the actual things of that would make this happen? Are any of them in, in existence? Well, no, nobody has developed the specialized airplanes that might be used, but you don't need those to start. Right. So that number, I mean, it's a human choice how much solar geoengineering to do. And I think it would be crazy to start it suddenly to turn it on. So that number you're quoting of 100 aircraft and all that stuff, that was for something that was doing what we call two watts per square meter, offsetting roughly half of double CO2. I could see an argument that we gradually turn that on over sort of half a century or something, gradually ramping it up from zero. But uh, I'm certainly, I mean, I would strongly oppose somebody just wanting to do that right away. Sure. And so you wouldn't start with these hundred airplanes. You'd start with some much smaller number of airplanes. And you could start with existing airplanes because you don't need to go quite the, quite up to the highest altitude. So would these be like uh, like KC-135s, like strato, uh, the strato tankers, like a, a Boeing 737 type Those airplane? Would they be smaller? Quite, How, yeah, I think if you wanted to start, you'd start with something that has a slightly higher ceiling for payload. So like uh, there, there are business jets that have a Gulfstream T-650 carries uh, five tons to 51,000 feet, for example. So that would be something you could just barely use to get started. Right. So... Uh, that's the uh, you also talk about the possibility of using calcium carbonate there are other there are other types of, of of compounds that you could use but sulfuric acid you're saying that's the one that right now you say has the most <clears throat> there's the most experience with this, this would be the one that is off the shelf and people kind of understand it right that um uh, yeah i think it's the thing we know the most about and and I think that it's unlikely that it would make sense to do that at really large scale late in the century. I think it's likely you'd replace if if the world decided to do solar geoengineering, that after a few decades you'd stop using sulfate and use something else. But I think it uh, uh, starting with sulfate makes a lot of sense because we we have so much knowledge. So talk about the you mentioned the amount of money that is going into climate research, climate science in general, and that the geoengineering slice of that is still relatively small. Now, I think your numbers are from three years ago. Can you give us an idea about that? What is the total number of amount that's going to climate research? And then how much what fraction of that is it related to geoengineering? Well, the fraction of geoengineering is really tiny. Um, uh, it's of order. It's hard to measure exactly, but it'd be of order. Um, you know, 10 million a year globally kind of numbers. Um, and and climate science is hard to know, but the U.S. global change research budget is a border two and a half, three billion, and maybe Europe's is kind of similar. So that would make as a guess, global research in climate sciences, including the satellite assets, is maybe of order 10 billion. Uh -huh. So 1% or less. Um, but this has already met a lot of uh, criticism. I, I just uh, there was one quote from uh, Raymond Pierre Humbert, who from the University of Chicago, who called this idea 
I just like I like this phrase: wildly, utterly, howlingly, barking mad. Al Gore, yeah, insane, that's what utterly people mad. say when they don't have an argument. Fair, fair enough. But if Ray, if Ray had a clear argument, if he had a clear way to say that what the scientific community is was wrong, he'd give it. If Ray had a reason to believe that something that we've said, that the scientific community has said, because there's a fair amount of science in this now, that we got it wrong, he'd publish a paper showing we were wrong. You say something's barking mad when you're just really pissed off, but you don't actually have an argument. Well, so I, I guess what I'm, the, it seems to me from the outside and looking at this without someone on a strong opinion one way or the other that the idea though of geoengineering has been kind of pushed out of the mainstream because the mitigation argument has been the one that's been front and center but your argument is that if i'm understanding you right this has to be uh, something that is much embraced much more by mainstream climate scientists because the, in your view this is something we're going to have one of the tools we're going to ultimately have to use is that a fair i'm pretty careful to never to say the have to word okay. my job is to okay. inform public policy my job is to communicate the environmental risks and science as best i can and that's not i i think we often i think scientists often have screwed up in the climate debate by folding in their own values too much and by dictating what should happen science can make if then statements science can say if we keep emitting fossil fuels without doing anything we'll have gigantic climate change of a certain size. And, uh, but science can't tell you what's the right pace to cut emissions, and science can't tell you whether we should do solar geoengineering. It just can't. Right, but you're arguing that you're, but this should be more carefully considered. I mean, is that yes, a fair? Yes, I'm arguing that. That's a different statement. And I, I think, I'm, yes, I, I think we should do substantially more research and begin the international deliberations about what the rules would be for governing these technologies. Well, then let's start there then, or let's follow yeah. up on that then, because the international law on this or the, how this would work in an international framework to me is I mean, dauntingly complex. Um, has it been discussed in, in international forums about how this might work? Where, 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 where does that lie these days? Yes, it's certainly been discussed. Um, I mean, it's been discussed up to heads of state in some cases. Um, it's complicated to say where it lies. There's no formal process, but there's lots of conversations, some at quite a high level. There's a thing that I'm an advisor to called the Global Overshoot Commission, and people can look that up and look at the commissioners, but that's probably the highest level group of political people who've ever dealt with these topics, probably with carbon removal and solar geometry and adaptation, basically with all the, the things beyond emissions cuts. And that has four X heads of state on it, so it's a you know pretty high level panel. And is that based? Is that is that a, is it a formal organization? Is it a panel informal? No. Does it have? It it's doesn't one have of a these home? things that that uh, no, we set it up. So so this is there's a there's definitely a prototype for this. It's a freestanding commission, so it has no power and it wasn't asked for. But this is a bit of a template that's been used in other cases where the UN system. I hardly need to tell you is pretty bureaucratic. And sometimes there's things that a lot of people would know need to be talked about. The UN system itself has trouble doing it. But a commission like this, who's got a lot of people who are tightly connected to that system, but who are uh, speaking on their own behest, can articulate points of view that can then get taken up by the international system in a more organized way. Sure. One of the things I've heard you say as well, uh, was that it was likely that this type of um, experiment um, would be done by a smaller country, not necessarily the US or China at first, that it would be some other country, particularly one perhaps in the tropics or another one that was had serious risks from climate change that they would embark on this, uh, perhaps on their own. Um, it, it, tell me why that's the case. Why do, how do you why do you see that as a, the, that these countries would look out and say, well, we have to do this, we have to start this experiment, and then would the possibility well, not somebody... really about experiment there. This is about deployment. I think Fair this enough. is about interests and checks and balances. So the I mean, a basic thing we know about climate is that uh, it warms up the world and the, and the temperature increases are worse for places that are hotter. So temperature increases both kill people and reduce productivity, and they do that more for hotter countries. So an added degree temperature is much worse for Indonesia or India or the Philippines than it is for Sweden or Canada. 
And so that's the basic kind of inequality of climate change. And it's also true when it comes to extreme storms. And so kind of flipping that around, those countries have the most to benefit from stopping or reversing the climate change. But And but, also, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, that's the big one. Okay. Well, but game this out for me, because is it possible then one of these countries would begin this experimentation and then another country would say, hey, you know, we don't want this. I mean, is this potential, what's the potential for conflict over even experimenting around this? Because the modeling here and the, 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 the uncertainties are quite large, aren't they? Well, you got a lot of different questions packed up there. So yeah. on the political side, um, I mean, yeah, we can, we've can. we gamed lots and lots of scenarios, but I don't know how much those games are worth. It's very hard to foresee the way things will go. I think you keep talking about experiments. I think there's a giant gulf, literally a factor of a million gulf, between the kinds of experiments people are talking about and actually deployment at a scale that would be climate relevant. Sure. So uh, there is controversy about experiments because there are groups that really believe that there should be, that we shouldn't be talking about this. So they'll oppose even small experiments. Um, but I think that my view is that is gradually going away and that the main, the fundamental underlying conflict, I mean, even the groups that oppose small experiments, they're clear, they're not actually worried about the experiment, they're worried about the idea. And so my, I think the big, the big dispute will actually be disputes about deployment. And yes, it's certainly possible that if one country just started to deploy, other countries would oppose. But countries have self-interest and they can think a move ahead of the chessboard. So they probably wouldn't just start unilateral deployment. They develop some coalition of countries that want to do deployment. And then you got to think about how these coalitions fit together and, and, and how they play out. Sure. But you said worried about the idea. I think that's an interesting concept in that the there's been so much focus on mitigation, right, that we have to make these drastic cuts in CO2. And we can disagree on how much those cuts might actually happen. I'm just looking at the numbers and see the CO2 continuing to rise, particularly in the developing world. But uh, but the the worried about the idea that somehow well, if we hold, if, hold, hold on, actually, CO2 emissions are going down in the US and down yes. in Europe. So that's a lot of the developing world. No, so fair, I'm not sure you've enough. got your facts right. Well, if, and I don't think there's room for us to disagree that if you want a stable climate, you have to bring emissions to zero. Would you agree with that? Well, uh, look, I mean, we can go far into the what you know what emissions are and where they're going. I see the trend lines going up, particularly well, in, in in the developing sure. so world. So I'm not talking about visions, but if you want a stable climate, you got to bring that emissions to zero. Do you agree with that? Well, I mean, yes, if we're hoping to reduce any climate impact, those emissions are going to have to fall dramatically. But I know that's again, a different statement. You can't. No, no, that gets it fundamentally wrong. This is the key mistake. OK, and it's a mistake that it turns out a lot of people make even like there's a survey of people that might keep mistake. Climate change depends on cumulative emissions. Sure. So even if you eliminate emissions, you don't actually eliminate climate impacts. You just stop making them worse. OK, but because Fair. it depends on cumulative emissions, it is pretty much a fact as simple as like gravity is a simple equation that if you do not, if you don't bring net emissions to zero, then climate risks will grow without bound. That is literally true. And so therefore we need carbon and climate, therefore we need carbon removal. You have removal. to bring emissions to zero. Net so, e so then if we have to either have carbon yeah. removal or geoengineering, as you've said. Then to, well, geoengineering to, isn't about emissions, it doesn't solve the problem. No, yeah. it's, it's really that you must bring net emissions, that is, actual emissions net of carbon removals have to get to zero if you want a stable climate. I think that's pretty okay. close to a hard fact. Okay. I think the political dispute is how fast to do it. Fair enough. But your, your point about the worried about the idea that somehow that any focus on the geoengineering would take focus away from mitigation. Is that what you yes, would, that's yeah, the concern. Right. Yes. OK, because that I think is the key here that I see is that there are these ideas around mitigation, particularly around large scale renewables, which I've been very critical of because of the land use issues, the material inputs, transmission, et cetera. So what's the got, big land use input, what input problem for solar? Well, solar has power density 10x wind, so it has higher power density, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's it's gaining more traction. But I've seen and documented over and over, in fact, over 300 examples of wind energy rejections or restrictions in the U.S. You've done similar work on this. You, in you didn't answer my question. I said, "What's the big energy density problem for solar?" I don't think I see one. Wind is different. Wind has real constraints. But solar, you can imagine running the world up to many terawatts of solar if you actually build it in sunny places and move it around with a pretty small land footprint. A land footprint is less than 1% of land area. 
Fair enough. And I'll, I'll concede the power density of solar is 10x that of wind. But I also see all across the U.S. In fact, I'm uh, local communities saying we don't want these solar projects in our in our in our well, county. Generally, our people don't want anything. That doesn't well, that's, prove and, anything. And that's fair enough. But these are these are these are still people. People seem to want the power, and they want to drive around. So in a they, democracy, they, they, I will choices. agree. I will agree yeah. with that. But the power density issue is I, I, I see that. But I also see the land use con constraints and the transmission siding constraints are very real. And I think they get ignored in all of these models being put out by a lot of elite academics that ignore this land use issue as the fundamental. I mean, this is the, the this is the first first priority issue, first first principles. But in so any case, I agree it's a really important issue. I've worked on it a lot myself, but I think you're overstating it. And I, that's why I'm calling you on it. I think well, it's very different for solar and wind. So the way I think about it is if you want to decarbonize industrial society with pretty low environmental impact and low land footprint, you're either doing it with solar or nuclear or some combination. There's nothing else you can do it at large scale without big environmental impacts. But, but solar is definitely possible. It has an energy density that works. And yes, transmission siting is hard, especially in America, for sure. It's hard to yeah. build anything. That's a true statement. Absolutely true. And yes, it's ignored in models a lot. Yes. And that's why I'm so pro-nuclear. That The, the, the yes. footprint is so much smaller, we can use the existing transmission network, and we're not going to have to build a lot more. So solar has other supply chain issues that we can talk about, polysilicon and, and the rest of it. But nevertheless, I'm much more bullish on nuclear in the long term than I am on, am on solar for the reasons we've discussed. But so what, um, how much research is going to, what does the budget need to be, right? You, you've talked about the disparity in research and what are the next steps that we're going to be needed in terms of bringing more focus on this? Because you've been involved in, in, in pushing out the ideas around geoengineering in the public media, which in, 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 in big forums, what else has to happen to get this more traction in the, in the public debate? So I think it'd be appropriate to have a budget that is, um, you know, of order 5% or more of the budget for climate science, that is that 5% or more of total climate science be spent on this topic. And that's consistent with what the US National Academy said. Uh, that's obviously there's lots of people in the kind of mainstream environmental and climate community who don't agree with that. And just to be clear, the fundamental issue here is is dispute about this, what's often called the moral hazard, the idea of this will distract from emissions cuts. I think that's the underlying concern, most of all. But I think the research of that scale would be what would be required to really substantially reduce uncertainties about these about solar energy sharing. But I think it's really important that it be kind of globalized. Uh, this is something that inherently is global. There's no, there's only one planet. You change things in one place, you affect things somewhere else. So unlike lots of other things where the issue is about driving down cost, solar energy sharing is cheap enough that making it cheaper really isn't the issue. The issue is building up trust. And I think trust gets built up by, to me, by having no single actor in charge of research, but having a diffuse research community that's diffuse really around the world. Well, I like that idea about the, the building up trust. So then you would need the leading academic institutions from Europe, Asia, the U.S. all working together on this then. So you're thinking well, about some kind of consortium all, of academics. I mean, lots of them working on it. You don't need, I think actually you don't want everybody working together because then they come to come to one answer. I think diversity of opinion is really important. But but yeah, you want more institutions working on it seriously. And And to be clear, that is gradually happening. There's much more research and acceptance of research than there was even five years ago. And they're now, you know, I think it's changing, but it hasn't changed enough. Fair enough. So where would those experiments, because you would have to do some experiments at some kind of scale, where would they occur? What is there a, a would it, you, you mentioned that if this were going to be deployed at scale, it could be done, it would likely be done from an airstrip or a country in the tropics. But where would the first experiments uh, for this kind of in, injection of, of sulfuric acid in the atmosphere, where would those happen? So, so the experiments are there fundamentally to improve our knowledge of how the atmosphere works, of what we call our process understanding that, that, that we incorporate into global models. And so in some sense, those experiments, in a way, have been done for 100 years because they're all the, the, the set of atmospheric science experiments. There are specific things that are worth doing to help us specifically go after things that we, that we don't know that are really relevant to solar geo. And there have been some already done. So there was a thing called the E-Piece experiment that was done by Lynn Russell was the PI a bunch of years ago. There's an experiment in uh, Australia that's been done making a certain kind of, of cloud scattering. 
uh, we've been proposing an experiment. This is triospheric experiment that was, uh, uh, we tried to do it in Sweden because that's where a balloon operator we wanted to work with was or aren't very many balloon operators and we were uh, prevented from doing that. But we expect we will be able to do it somewhere else. And prevented how? Uh, the Swedish government basically uh, responded to critics and and told the balloon company that, that we could they couldn't fly us. Well, that's not a good indicator, right? You would think that no, in Sweden, that's correct. But but things are changing, and yeah. Well, I mean, I say that because Sweden is, a, I mean, a developed country, a lot of very smart people there, but that the, that there would be some pressure that would prevent even this kind of a relatively small scale experiment. Um, well, just to be clear, the experiment was tiny. It was like releasing a kilogram of material. So even the strongest critics didn't say the experiment was dangerous. Uh, uh, but as I said, they opposed the idea of doing it, which is their right to do. I don't actually fault the critics at all. I fault the Swedish government for not having a, a, a serious debate and making an informed science and risk-based decision. Yeah, but it goes back to this idea about the the, the moral hazard idea that even, and I, I just want to focus on this a little bit more because it seems to me that the, the, the the focus on mitigation and we can disagree on what you know how much mitigation is going to be effective right and you're you know yes it's true emissions in the u.s and and, and europe have plateaued but that the idea um, um uh, the argument being oh well if we're not focused on mitigation we're we're going to lose the fight and this would be somehow surrendering to more co2 emissions is that have i got my finger on it is that that that's the moral hazard here yes the concern the concern is that by having a a sort of a tech fix a get out of jail free card that, that get out of jail free card that people will will not do the thing they should do and this another way to think about this is a risk compensation that we know for lots of personal behavior that if you give people a potentially risk reducing technology like airbags or whatever that they'll actually end up taking more risk and that's actually not necessarily irrational at, at, at an individual level if you take sure. pleasure from the things that are risky um so I think that's the underlying concern of, of many people. And I think it's a valid concern, absolutely valid concern. But given the fact that climate change is proportionally cumulative emissions, so even if we eliminate emissions, the climate change is still there. And given the risks, the acute risks, especially the people that are many of the poorest people in the world, my view is that that argument is not a basis for saying we we shouldn't do research. Sure. And fair enough. But let me let me ask you about models, because, you know, a friend of mine, Chuck Spinney, worked in the Pentagon for many years, helped build fighter planes and he warned me many years ago about models. And, and there's a lot of talk about this. And I'm just going to put it to you, you know, in a way that I think Chuck would say is are these atmospheric models, are they robust enough to even to be reliable when it comes to the many variables already existing? And then you're adding another variable with uh, these uh, with with geoengineering, with reflective particles in the atmosphere. Are the models that good? I guess it'd be the, the shortest question. Yeah, the answer is the models are amazing. And and you can see that because we use them every day and and people trade big money on the models. Um, I have a funny tale that I had friends who were involved in some of the first uh, uh, science that was able to do a beginning of a job on El Nino forecasts. And they knew that they were getting it right when grain traders started to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And and. Uh, weather forecasts, I know people like to complain, but they're actually stunningly good. And they're much better than they were uh, half a century ago. There's been a steady improvement. And these are fundamentally the same models. Uh, that represents this deep, improved knowledge of the way the atmosphere works. Um, uh, there are just lots of examples that show how well models do. So, I mean, to give you some examples, uh, uh, Pinatubo was a big volcano in 1992 that put a lot of sulfur in the stratosphere and the, and the climate cooled. Uh, people predicted the amount of cooling before it was observed. It's always easy to predict things after the fact, but they predicted it before it was observed. And how much so, was so that? No, there's actually a lot of a lot of basis to believe those models. Right. And what was the what, how much material did did Pinatubo release? What was that of the scale of that in terms of the overall mass of stuff that came out of the, the earth on that eruption? It was about 8 million tons of sulfur that got into the stratosphere. And is that what would be required? I, I, I know I have a, the, a, your flight numbers here and some of the other numbers. What, what, what are you proposing or what do you think? What are, what are some of the indicators? Would, would we require something on the same order of magnitude, 8 million tons, to achieve that same kind of uh, cooling that Pinatubo did? No. Um, uh, you can do better because you can get the size distribution of particles better and Pinatubo is sort of different because it's a pulse. I think, uh, you know, back to that number you're citing from that talk I gave, if you want to do, you know, cool temperatures by a degree or so, 
you're talking something of order 2 million times a year, round numbers. And you'd have to, it would have to be continually applied. Yeah, in that's way. correct. I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I was in. And so, and so the point is that, and you know, your first reaction when somebody says we're going to put 2 million tons of sulfuric acid in the sky should be that that's completely insane. But, but we do put 50 million tons a year in the lower atmosphere now. So it's only, you know, 4%. And, and, and so it's it's not as big a change to the way the world is than you might think. So as I thought about this, I was in Arkansas a few weeks ago speaking to a, a rural electric co-op, and I saw a crop duster. Um, and yeah. I'm I'm only I, I can only think in this terms that you're going to have G five G six airplanes crop dusting the the stratosphere. Is that uh, is that a fair way to think about yeah, it? How, how that would be applied? I mean, the reason why it's so much more effective to put in the stratosphere. So. Uh, is, is that material stays in the stratosphere for about two years, round numbers. And so, and, and things mix in the slow cycle in the stratosphere. It's very different from the atmosphere we're used to, where the kind of mixing time in the atmosphere is more like a week. So it's, it's a really different thing. Um, but, but yes, you'd have to have a continuous set of aircraft moving material up to, to the stratosphere, for sure. And that aerosolization would be somewhat similar then to crop dusting. I mean, I'm just, it's the only thing I, in my head, no, I know. Well, not obviously, no. It, uh, lots of the ways that we think about doing it, you'd put, if you're doing it with sulfur, you'd want to put a sulfur vapor, SO2, uh, in, or H2S or something. And that's a vapor that you can't see. And it takes it actually a month or so to oxidize to end up making the aerosols. Gotcha. Okay. So you wouldn't actually see any, wouldn't actually be aerosolizing the same way at all. Good. Well, let's, let's return. I know you you're on a schedule here, so I want to cut to a couple of other things. You've done some good analysis on land use and renewables. And I've often cited the paper you did with Lee Miller in 2018 on wind energy's land use that you came up with. If we were to attempt to generate enough electricity in the U S uh, uh, with wind alone, it would require roughly 900,000 square kilometers. That's roughly the same number that Václav Smil came up with, uh, uh, in his book, uh, what was it? Uh, energy realities in 2010. I thought it was, uh, uh, again, the, 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 that's one of the constraints on the system, but what's interesting to me, I guess I'll get to the point this question. What's interesting to me about the, what we're talking about here with geoengineering and mitigation is that you're not going to have a big land use footprint. It's not in the energy inputs for the, this kind of system. You, you use the word leverage around geoengineering. I thought that that was an interesting term and that you get a lot of bang for your buck, I guess, is what, how you were talking about it. Yeah, certainly it takes pretty small amounts of money and materials, but um, that's that just means that money is not the decisive factor. The decisive factor is risk versus risk. There's risks of doing it and there's risks of not doing it. And the issue is to weigh and compare those risks. That's really the essence of the question. Um, you know, there are lots of other things in our society where it's not primarily about money, it's about risk balancing. That's true of lots of things. So, sure. so uh, uh, I think I think the issue is solar, yeah, the bottom line, solar geo is gonna be cheap enough by certainly if it's stratospheric aerosols, that it's not really gonna be constrained by money and there's no reason to make it cheaper. It's just that we need to really understand better how the risks are. And in order for there to be a kind of stable deployment, you, you know, obviously, you never have a world where everybody agrees, but you need enough level of trust between enough people in our countries that the thing is basically going to work for it to keep working without um, people really disagreeing or wanting to shut it down. And are you doing much more work on the land use part of this? Or you, you did research, it was, uh, I've forgotten the name of the, the, the title of the paper that you published back then four years ago. Are you doing any more work in that area? Or have you moved on to other fair? Not other really. Fields? No, I did that wind power work over, I don't know, starting in 204 or something like that, starting early in about 20 years ago. And I'm not really doing much more now. It's, uh, uh, I kind of like to go back and write an overview paper, because I, I agree with you. I think I, I feel like you were overstating it about solar, but I agree that people undercount the land use, undercount the importance of the land use footprint of some renewables, particularly of of of, uh, of wind. And I think the there really are impacts of wind that aren't zero and that people need to think about more. And to me, that means we should sort of, it doesn't mean we should not build any wind, but it means we should tip the balance to focus more on solar. In fact, I think this is going to kind of sort out anyway, because solar is just going to get cheaper. I think the big issue is really, as you say, about building transmission lines. Yeah. 
Well, and the Mansion Schumer bill, well, the Mansion's infrastructure bill was pulled from the co the continuing resolution budget bill just yesterday, which I had a piece in the Hill about that yesterday. Because, um, yeah. uh, but um, anyway, let me ask you just a couple of other quick questions here. So, you you were at Calgary University of Calgary, now at Harvard. Uh, that's a big change, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, biggest change, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I bounced around a few times. I did Carnegie Mellon before that. And so, uh, well, and then you're a citizen of the, I looked at Wikipedia, you're a citizen of the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. You have three passports? I don't actually have three passports now or not three up-to-date ones. I don't have an up-to-date U.K. passport, but I did have one at one point. And this is why your father, your father was a Brit. Oh, some complicated thing. I guess uh, I was born in the U.S., but we moved to Canada when I was two years old. So I really feel more Canadian. If you ask me, yeah, I'm more culturally Canadian. I really, that's my kind of core allegiance, I guess. And my father was a Brit, though. So, yeah. So does this mean you're a hockey fan then, I'm guessing? I'm moderate hockey fan. Okay. Not that much, fair, actually. Fair I'm enough. more of a climber and outdoors person, but... I, I, but but yeah, like any Canadian, I'll watch I'll yeah. watch hockey. F fair enough. There's but you also, I, anyway. I read that you had worked yeah. with Paul Corkum. I interviewed him in my uh, well, and actually, he's uh, featured in my uh, fifth book um, for his work on Addo Second Science. Um, cool. He, he was a very that's cool. really cool. That's neat that you interviewed Paul. I'm in huh. his in his lab in Ottawa, overlooking the uh, Ottawa River, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, I'd say he was, he was one of the most important mentors for me in my life. He, tell, he really, tell me about had, that, because he was a lovely guy when I met with him, and I thought, you know, this guy's really, and just taking pictures, what did he, what, I mean, I'm trying to, I write for a general audience, right? And yeah, what, yeah. I look at his his work, and he's photographing electrons, right? Which is just... Yeah, of, no, he's had, uh, uh, I mean... Uh, He's a yeah, absolutely. I couldn't win the Nobel Prize. Completely top scientist, but he's like a really low key maritimer. He came from Nova Scotia, as I remember, and uh, uh, he's just an extremely calm and good person. And he um, he ended up. Uh, I guess my stepmother had. Um, uh, they were working together for some. I don't know, providing support for Vietnamese boat people at the time, and. Uh, and then she extracted some promise that he would take me and another guy on a tour at, uh, of his lab when I was in late high school. And I asked a lot of questions and I guess I didn't ask, ask enough good questions that he ended up hiring me. And so I worked there for three summers, including like the last two summers of high school. And it was just completely kind of made me in terms of getting me started in physics. It was absolutely wonderful. And it was also kind of lucky because at that point he wasn't so famous and not such a big lab. So he had a lot of time to spend kind of mentoring me and teaching me physics. And it was just fantastic. Well, we've talked now about power density, and I wrote in, in the book, and because I calculated the power density of the lasers that he's using, they're 10 to the 18th, an exawatt of power yeah, density. Yeah, no, which I worked is, on the first, I, I worked on building picosecond amplifiers for his, his uh, one of the, we're trying to, to, to get up to milliwatts in the picoseconds. And, and so are you staying up with Corkum these days? Because he also just was awarded another big, uh, big prize, uh, a Canadian prize, science prize. I mean, he's had several. I'm not. Yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. He's had a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen them socially reasonably often when I go to Ottawa. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and so, well, on that score then, so we've talked about geoengineering, and I think that's interesting, but I'm also just kind of curious about you as a, as in science and how you view science. And let me ask you this question about academics and their relationship to the broader society. Is there, is there a, because I've thought about this lately in terms of some of the science, some of the things that are coming out of academics and, you know, I'm not one, I'm not going to be one. Is there what duty do they or do they have a duty to the general public? Where is their allegiance? I guess would be another way to think about that. Yeah, I think they have. I mean, in some sense, they're working or should be working for the public at some level. So, yeah, I think they should. And I think that um, uh, I really I, I like what it says on the Einstein statue outside the National Academy, which I'm not going to get the quote exactly right, but it says something like, those who have the privilege to seek after the truth, you know, who basically get paid these salaries, do all cool science and experiments and write books and whatever that people like me get to do, um, have a duty to tell all that they know. So I think, I think my view is it's really people's job to try and as clearly as possible explain the, the facts as they know them. And they can separately state their political views and they have every right to do that. But I think it's important that academics find ways to try and separate what they can say from their expertise from what they happen to believe based on politics, which like anybody else are going to have beliefs. 
So, well, that's interesting. Well, in your case, then to say all that they know. So as I, as I perceive what, how we've talked about this, what your charge as you see it on the geoengineering side is to push this forward and say, we have to be seriously getting this more into the mainstream debate. Yes. And it hasn't and been. Is that, a fair pushing, is that a fair summary? Yes. And I'm pushing some of my fellow academics who will behind the scenes say, yes, you guys might be right about the science of this, you know, but essentially they're saying, but the public can't handle it or the politicians can't handle it or we should not talk about it because it will be misused. And and, and we I can only focus on when we can only focus on mitigation because yeah, we, that's we, because we that's have, but we I have, think that's a reasonable fear, but I think if you're really not telling people about something that's potentially useful and can save lives because you're worried about the politics, that's, it's not your job. It's, we're not a secret, academics aren't a secret society that make the final decisions. We're just supposed to be informing people and producing knowledge. And academics don't have special knowledge about how politics works. I mean, unless they're ones who are really expert in politics. And, and so I feel that when my colleagues from the sciences do that, they're overstepping, they're, they're not clearly enough separating their political concerns from, from their knowledge. That the scientists are becoming too political in yeah. their, in I mean, presenting so you, their views. If you views. pick up on, on that, on that Ray P. Humbert quote you started with, Ray is very worried about this. He really believes it will be misused. I actually really respect and like him a lot, but I think it's his duty to separate the fact that Ray is genuinely a monster brain, amazingly good geophysicist. And if he has particular reasons why he thinks me and others are wrong geophysically, where he's got expertise, he should say it and use the power of his expertise to say, you guys are wrong, or I believe you're wrong. Here are the reasons. But, but I think where people overstep is where effectively they're getting the credit for being uh, an expert, but they're talking about something on which they're really not expert in this case on, you know, whatever the politics is going to be that the answer is we just we're not very good at predicting the way politics will go. Well, the, the thing that pops in my head, David, as you say that, and again, my, my guest is David Keith. He's a, uh, a professor of applied physics at Harvard University. He's uh, on Twitter, among other places, D Keith climate at D Keith climate. Um, when you said that about the duty to the public, the part that it pops in my head is you're talking about geoengineering and the relatively small budget. There are massive budgets for mitigation. Is that part of why this the debate is is skewed more toward mitigation because there's a whole lot more money there? And I say that. Well, I mean, the, no, that that's <clears throat> that's cart before horse. We should be spending much, much more money on mitigation because mitigation is really expensive, and we have to mitigate. Right, but there's a I lot of industrial, be... a lot of industrials, big industry, big big business that's interested has a lot of money at stake in mitigation as well, right? Sure. So like any big activity that people do, there's politics and profits and what do you know, they interact. But 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 that's always going to be true. I'm not defending it, but we just, you know, that's the way the world is. But but whatever, mitigation is expensive. Actually cutting emissions at a reasonable pace is going to cost us like 1% of GDP. So we need to have a lot of money flowing. Sure. If, but if the, I was but boss, it would be less gifts going out and more just setting rules about emissions. But those are still imposing costs that make money flow. The point is the actual flows of money for mitigation should be much, much more than flows of money for solar geo. I don't think it's about the money flow equivalency. It's about the fact that in thinking about managing the risks, we need to think about the full set of things, emissions cuts, carbon removal, solar geo and adaptation. And we need to think in four dimensions, think about all of them and take seriously what their strengths and weaknesses are and how they fit together to produce a, uh, you know, a, a, a path through climate this century that is um, fair, that, you know, is, uh, um, doesn't punish people too much for, for by, by mitigating so hard that it really crushes people's jobs, but also doesn't hurt the poorest people who will suffer most from climate change or doesn't hurt them, you know, hurts them less than that otherwise would. Sure. So you mentioned carbon removal. Let's just touch on that real quickly. And then I just have a few more questions. So Again, I see this as a scale problem, just a massive amount of atmosphere, you know, scale, mass of air, et cetera, that have to be treated, have to be, then you have to separate the CO2 and then you have to put it somewhere. But it sounds to me like you haven't, have you focused much of your work on carbon removal? How do you view that as a, as a, as a, uh, a strategy with regard to climate? So I, I, I do want to wrap up in just a sec, actually. Uh, um, well, so I'm I'm biased or potentially biased because I started one of the probably two most active companies that's doing direct air capture, which is one version of carbon removal. Um, um, I definitely I, I think that 
Um, carbon removal is the only way to draw down the kind of underlying climate risk. This is where these things fit together, the underlying CO2. Um, I think some of these things appear to be pretty scalable. I think adding alkalinity to the ocean and um, and and direct air capture both seem to be scalable in the sense that there's not obvious kind of land use or materials constraints. I, but I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Point, adding adding what yeah. to the ocean? Did you say alkalinity? Alkalinity. Okay. Yeah. Which is different from because I've also heard about uh, iron flakes and and so on is another way to for carbon. yeah yeah iron seem like a a good idea 20 years ago. Uh, uh, it's a high leverage thing potentially, but it just, the short answer is it doesn't work in a meaningful way. Okay. Um, so then uh, you said you need to go. So just a, three last questions. So who, what, who, which scientists did dead or living do you admire? You mentioned we've talked about Corkum. Who, who's in yeah, your pantheon? Well, Paul, who, certainly. <laughs> who's, in your, who's in your pantheon? Oh, man. Um, um, oh, I don't know. Uh, actually, you get to meet Feynman for a minute once. Um, uh -huh. uh, uh, some of those old, uh, Phil Morrison, some of those old, we used to call them the bomb Johnnies, Phil Morrison. I, that's a name I don't know. Who is he? He was an, one of the younger people. He, he younger people on the weapons project who then helped to really become a little politically rad radicalized, but in really interesting ways and helped to get people working on energy and environmental topics and he was on the Manhattan Project. You're saying he's on the Manhattan yeah, yeah. Project. Yeah, he did some beautiful um, public communications. They, he, he and his wife, they worked very much together. Phil and Phyllis had a series on, I guess, on PBS called The Ring of Truth that was just really one of the best things I've ever seen in, in science education. He was an amazing rat. And what about Feynman? Was, did you have a reaction? Feynman, I, he was asked to describe electricity. He said something like, well, a thing moves over here and then a thing moves over here. And I thought it was like, well, it was almost like, and he also said something that I thought was really very yeah. right on, which is that energy is a very difficult thing for people to understand. And I think that that is absolutely true. Yeah, I'm sure it is. And I, I so I, I think I, I've got to go about now, but I think those are, those are some anyway. Okay. What books are you reading? Oh man, um, um, I really, I really got to go. I want to eat some food before my next meeting. I said I wanted to go. Okay, <laughs> all right, fair enough. Uh, my guest has been David Keith. He's a, a physics a professor of applied physics at Harvard University. You can find him on Twitter, on the Harvard website, etc. David Keith, thanks for being on the podcast. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. Thanks a whole and lot. All Take you care. Pod Bye -bye. podcast land. Tune in for the next episode of the Power Hungry Podcast. Until then, see ya.